Thanks, David. Uh, so this is going to be a sort of weird synopsis of a bunch of things that I've done recently. So bits and pieces are joint work with uh, Jacob Steinhardt, who's a student at Stanford, Yu Chen Zhang, who's maybe here, Yu Chen, not here. All right, he's a student here, uh, and Mike and Martin, who are my former advisors. OK, so the, uh, and stop me if you have questions. I'm just going to write on the board, and we'll see where we get to. So the, the, uh, the setting for this, uh, for this talk is uh, sort of the usual statistical estimation setting. And we are going to get, I'm going to say we get uh, a bunch of data, say xi, now we'll write superscripts, xi drawn iid from some distribution p. And uh, our goal is to estimate some quantity <clears throat> or some uh, statistic, say theta of this distribution. OK? So this might be like we just want to estimate the mean of our distribution or the mean of our observations. Uh, but the, the, the trick in this talk and uh, the sort of setting we're working in is that we only we never actually get to observe the xi's fully. We're going to observe something else, which is a result of putting some kinds of constraints on our inferential procedures. Okay, so we only observe uh, zi instead of xi. And so, an example where you might see something like that is say. Uh, in if you had like a distributed system and you were collecting data remotely and you had some kind of communication constraints or bandwidth constraints, maybe you can't send your full observations, you send some restricted version. Or uh, we might be doing something with privacy where you know, people don't trust me to collect data so they don't want to tell me the truth about themselves. I get some perturbed version of the true data. Okay? Uh, but so the, there's sort of a the picture that we're gonna, and, and so what we'd like to understand is what, what effect does observing some, something instead of the XIs have on our ability to estimate things. So let's, um, let's draw a picture, and this will be kind of the foundation for, for the talk. So the, the setting throughout is that we're going to just assume that we draw some uh, V in a set, script V uniformly at random, and then conditional on seeing v, we generate data, OK? Conditional on v, generate x, i, 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 d. All right, and, then the, and then the picture is that we actually don't get to observe these. We observe z, so we have some kind of graphical model where we have v generates x1, and that becomes via some sort of channel or other, becomes z1. And then v generates x2, which becomes z2. And these can depend on one another. And we're going to repeat this n times until we get to zn. OK. David. What is u a r? Is it a kind uniformly of? at random. Oh, uniformly at random. Yeah. So we're just going to say that, I mean, this will be Sort of, we're, we're going to try to show that there are lower bounds on our ability to reconstruct v. So we're going to just say nature chooses some v at random, and we want to understand what effect does passing things through this additional channel have on our ability to recover v, as opposed to what we could do if we actually observed the truth. OK? So the goal is based on the zi, recover v. All right, and so the the ins well, it's not really an insight maybe for this uh, audience, but what we're gonna the tools we're gonna use to do this is that our ability to do this is controlled by how much you know information the z's actually carry about v in a in an information theoretic sense, uh, and so the whole game is to control something like the mutual information between z one to n and v by some kind of properties of these channels. And the insight 
is that uh, we can do this and by basically assuming that there's some kind of likelihood ratio bound on parts of these channels. And we'll see how this uh, comes out in the next couple minutes. So, so the, what we're going to do is say that uh, if we have bounds on the likelihood ratio, which I will define shortly, in our system, we can do this. And in particular, we're going to look at two kinds of uh, likelihood ratio bounds. So, so what we're going to have is, the first version is we're going to assume, say, if we have p of x given v divided by p of x given v prime is less than or equal to e to the alpha for some alpha. Or we could say that, here we'll call this, uh, we'll not worry about that, we'll say p or p of z given x divided by p of z given x prime is less than or equal to e to the alpha. So if there's any alpha for which either of these hold, we're going to be able to prove interesting things. So where might this, this will come up in constructions that we do. And what we'll see is that, or, and this say, if you've seen, has anyone here, have, who here has seen differential privacy? Many of you, almost everyone has. So this, this for example, would come up in privacy where you say, uh, you know, no matter what the initial data is, x or x prime, what I release has to sort of look the same at the outset. So this might come up in some sort of like privacy constrained settings. And this one we will construct examples. And the main, uh, the main results that... Sorry, I lost you in, in the, what's the goal. Because you see, based on ZI, you recover V. So the, the, the figure of merit is, is what? Minimizing the probability of a wrong guess of V? Uh, we could say that. I'm, not, we're, I'm, not gonna be, I'm being a little bit vague about exactly what we want to do. Uh, but yeah, you could say we want to minimize the probability of error in recovering V and understand lower bounds on that probability of error. So that's one thing we might want to do. We'll give an, I'll give an example later of uh, estimating a sparse mean, and we'll see how we can formulate that in this framework. Okay. All right, and uh, the sort of flavor of results that we're going to see is the following. Is that any time you have some kind of likelihood ratio bound on any part of the channel, you're going to get a strong data processing inequality of the following form. You'll see that in case, say, 1, and we'll call this 2. In case 1, we get something like the neutral information between z and v is less than or equal to some constant, c1, times e to the alpha minus 1 squared, times the neutral information between x and v. Okay, so whatever information there was between x that x captures about the system, we've lost some factor that looks like e to the alpha minus 1 squared and some constant thing. And in the other case, x, uh, vector here? X. x could be, uh, yes, x is the entire sample. So it could, be, it could be x1 to xn, or we could do this. Yeah, we'll make it here. We'll do it this way. x1 to n and v, and we'll make this z1 to n. <laughs> but this constant will change depending on the problem. And then in the other case, when we have this, we get a result of the form i, z1 to n, and v will be less than some other constant that depends on our problem again, times the same thing. Yeah, but in the assumptions 1 and 2, those are the vectors, that's the vector z given the vector x? Uh, yeah, sorry, let's write this this way and this way. x, i, prime. Yeah. So each individual example so is bounded by alpha. So you have some dependency in yeah, yeah. the alpha, uh, in, the, in the C, uh, in N? Yeah, because... Yes. There's some, depend there's some dependency in C on, say, the dimensionality of things. But there's no dependence on N. On alpha? Uh, or on alpha, right. But, I mean, getting, getting appropriate Cs is what's going to tell us things. But the point is, I guess, that... 
there's some kind of strong contraction here where, we can, where we're losing a lot of the information that might have initially been in the problem. And uh, oh, I'm sorry, this one was, sorry, I did this one wrong. What's that? This one I meant the information between z and x in this case. Okay, but let me give let me get go through a cup one example of this, and uh, that might make it clear exactly why we care about doing something like this, Robert. Should I think of C one and C two as being really small? They're going to be problem dependent, okay. so they may they may have some dependence on dimension, you know, and we'll we'll I'll show you an example where they do have a strong dependence on dimension. So alpha is to be close to zero. Alpha usually is somewhere between zero and one, <laughs> but you know it could be it could be anything. Sorry, goal is to recover V, right? The goal is to recover V. It seems to be going the wrong way. It's telling you it's hard to do so. Yes, that's exactly right. We're going to get results that say this is hard to do okay. as soon as we have constraints on our channel. And what, the, I mean, look, what this is going to tell us is that if you want to, say, have privacy, it's going to be hard to actually infer things about the real world. Or in, the, in another case, what the example I'll go through in this talk is that if there are communication constraints, it's hard to do inference of V. So let me, um, let me give a theorem and a consequence uh, that will maybe make a little bit more explicit these kinds of results. So we'll see. The constants are kind of important, right? Because the constants are super important. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's that? Otherwise, it's the product of C1 times that. Yes. Yeah, I agree with that. So these constants are problem dependent. Yeah, I mean, this is, this is the flavor of results. I'll give you one where I'm being very explicit in a second. How's that? OK. All right, so let's, um, let's give uh, one explicit theorem to make everyone equally unhappy. <laughs> so let's suppose V is chosen uniformly at random in the signed indices from 1 to D. So we're going to be looking at some kind of d-dimensional type of problem, OK? And let our xi's be d-dimensional random vectors. <coughs> Excuse me. And assume that the density, or the distribution, it doesn't really matter, uh, p of xi given v divided by p of xi given v prime is less than or equal to some e to the alpha. Okay. And conditional on v, the coordinates xj are independent. OK, so what's the game? The game is that we draw a vec uh, some v in 1 to d uniformly at random. And then we assume that there's this bounded likelihood ratio, where alpha is some constant. And we have independent coordinates. Then what we can show is the following result. P here is a density. So p, it doesn't, we could, if we want to be, we could write dp and make these radon nicodeme derivatives. Yeah, if that, if that makes you happier. But it, it really doesn't matter. This can be discrete. They can be densities. I don't actually need them to be in RD. They can be in an abstract space. But let's just leave it. Let's assume. Let's just call them densities and call it a day. Uh, so, sorry. Now you have subscript emerging. Yes. So, so x superscript i is a vector. X i is a vector. X i one through x i d in R to the d. So that, that the prob conditional probability or density yes. is on each component or? It's on the, it can be on each component or it can be on the entire vector. It doesn't actually matter for this result. It's just more like product, right? Yes. Yeah. OK, but so let's, let's, let's have this as our setup. Then the result is the following. Then for any. Uh, 
any index j. Actually, we don't even need this. We'll just write then. The following is true. One, the average over the coordinates of the KL divergence between uh, P of z 1 to n, given v equals j, from P of z 1 to n, given v equals minus j. Okay, so this is the average divergence across our entire thing, is going to be bounded by the following. 2 e to the alpha divided by the dimension times e to the alpha minus 1 squared um, times the sum from i equals 1 to n of the mutual information between xi and zi given z1 to i minus 1. Okay. So let's unpack this statement a tiny bit. So if we, if we squint at this, what, what is this saying? It's saying that the distance, the average distance between the distributions of what we observe is related to however much information z actually carries about x, right? Because this is the amount of information z will carry about x in the entire problem. Does everyone agree with that? So this is a sum of many informations, but it's re reduced by a factor of about alpha squared and divided by the dimension. So we're losing essentially a factor of the dimension here as to what we would have originally had in our problem. So you might say, OK, why does this matter? Why do we care about something like this? So let me give an example application of this theorem. And we will, we'll, you'll see kind of maybe an interesting consequence. So one consequence of this type of result is that under memory constraints, high dimensional estimation is hard. Why are you using j and minus j? What's special about the symmetry? I'm confused by your ordering. Um, what's special about the symmetry? Yeah, I mean, plus, there's nothing about plus or minus. Are you just arbitrary pairing things up? There, I'm, I'm be, it, I guess it wouldn't really matter. I could kind of put any sort of v's in there. The symmetry will be nice for us uh, when I give this consequence. Arbitrary pairings. Something. Arbitrary pairings, yeah. But is the, is the d and the size of the alphabet of v important coupled with the dimension of x? Yes. But I don't see how the coupling happens, right? You know, um, happens, yeah, let's give an example. Okay. How does that sound? All right, so let's say that let's let our vectors x be in minus 1, 1 to the d and say that e, the expectation of xj given v is equal to uh, 0 if v is not in plus minus j, and otherwise it's going to be delta or minus delta if v equals j and if v equals minus j. Okay? It's not delta, it's a j? What's that? That's a delta. It's not a function of j. Delta. Not a function of j at all. Okay? So now, so basically what I'm saying is that e of x given v equals j is just delta times the jth basis vector. Okay, so we have a so basically we have a mean with one non-zero component. All right, and let's say I want to estimate this mean based on n observations. So what what is the what is what does sort of modern high dimensional statistics tell us? Well, the dependence on the dimension should be limited, right? There's only one non-zero component. Somehow we don't feel like we should need very much data, right? But we have a but, the but here's, the, here's the following result. So then we, what? Sort of a standard result in uh, statistics, say, is that expectation over all possible uh, estimators, say theta hat, based on z1 to n, minus e of x given v, 
So let's say I want to estimate this. This is going to be bigger than or equal to delta squared over 2 times 1 minus the square root of the sum from j equals 1 to d of the KL divergence between p of z1 to n given v equals j and p of z1 to n given v equals minus j. All right. So the point is that estimation in this model is going to be somehow, the closer the distributions on z are, the harder estimation is going to be. Right? Yeah, question? This is, uh, this is a consequence of Pinsker's inequality. Basically, it's if we could estimate this well, we could test which index we were at. And our error would be delta squared. I'm not going to prove this inequality, but then yes, it's just essentially just a testing inequality. No, this is just something that's true. <laughs> By uh, this is Lacom actually. Yeah, the theorem is uh, debatable. That one is. This thing is accurate. But so why does this? Uh, but so let's let's now looking at this. Let's stick our the result of our theorem in there. Okay. So in this situation, well, our vectors x are just Bernoulli random variables, right? So we notice that p of xj equals 1, oopsie, given v, is in, it's going to be 1 of 1 plus delta over 2, 1 minus delta over 2, and 1 half, right? I mean, because these are just a bunch of Bernoulli coordinates with some slight bias, then what we see is that p of xj equals anything, say given 1 divided by v, or given v, it's less than or equal to 1 plus delta over 1 minus delta, which is, say, less than or equal to e to the 3 delta, if delta is less than or equal to 1 half. Right, so we actually have this likelihood ratio bound in this scenario because of the way we've constructed things. So we're trying to estimate a sparse mean, and we have this likelihood ratio bound. Now we can apply our theorem. And what do we get? We get that the expectation of the error for any estimator, um, for the expectation of x given v, is going to be greater than or equal to delta squared over 2 times 1 minus the square root of this quantity here, right? So we've got 2 e to the 3 delta divided by d times e to the 3 delta minus 1 squared and the sum of the mutual informations. So that's just plugging in our theorem. And now once we've got this, if you squint at this a little bit, let's, let's try to unpack what this means. So suppose we had some kind of constraint on communication in this system. All right, so suppose that uh, suppose that zi is restricted to b bits. Okay, so suppose I can only communicate b bits out of my system, right? Now, what is, can anybody tell me an upper bound on the mutual information between zi and xi in this scenario? I said I heard it somewhere. b. Yeah. What's that? b bits. 2 to the b values. Yeah. So then we know that the information that zi can actually carry about any of the xi's is going to be bounded by b, right? And so if we stick this in here, and I'm going to say, I'm going to sort of squint and say that this is about equal to delta squared. Is everybody okay with that? 
That's true for small delta. We said delta was less than or equal to a half anyway. Right? So if we squint a little bit, then we get that our estimation error for this sparse mean is greater than or equal to, with some constant factor fudging, delta squared times 1 minus the square root of delta squared times n divided by d uh, times the bit size b. Right? Everybody buy this one? So then once we've got that, we can choose delta to be whatever we want. And so if we just choose delta squared to be the minimum of 1 half, say, and uh, d divided by bn, then we get that the expected error of any estimator in this memory-constrained problem or communication-constrained problem is greater than or equal to something like the minimum of 1 half and d divided by b times n. All right, so why is this an interesting result? This is an interesting result because classical, well, not classical, sort of modern high dimensional statistics tells us that statistically, the number of observations we need scales only as log the dimension, right? And so here, so you might expect, okay, you know, if I could get away with sample size scaling only logarithmically in the dimension, maybe I don't need to communicate a whole lot, especially if I'm allowed to keep in memory all of the previous communications I've done. Right, because we we saw our picture earlier was that you had z1, which could inf inform z2, which could inform z3, etc. But this says that unless the number of bits we're communicating at each step is scaling at least almost linearly in the dimension, we're never going to have an error rate that's going to go to zero in a high dimensional statistical setting. So. I think uh, my time is basically up now. Sorry, that was kind of a blitz through everything. Um, but I guess the, the take home here is that you know, if we have some control over a likelihood ratio anywhere in a Markov chain, we can get strong data processing inequalities, which will give us interesting lower bounds on estimation problems as soon as we have constraints. So I'll stop there, and thanks for your attention. So delta is something you optimize the bound over, or delta is given by data? Delta is something I can choose to optimize the bound over. But I thought delta is given there, no? Is, uh, is uh, given by the model. Delta is given by the model, but I can choose the model, right? Okay. I'm proving a lower bound. I'm allowed to do whatever I want. What do you mean? I thought the connection from B to X is part of the model. It's not something you can choose, right? Well, the, okay, so the, <laughs> choosing everything. I can choose everything. I'm doing theory, right? Isn't that what we do? Uh, right, so, so if delta is given as part of the model, then yeah, things, things change a little bit. But if I can choose delta, so if I'm just trying to prove a lower bound on sparse estimation, then I'm allowed to choose sort of the signal size and things like that, or the, the size of the, uh, the non-zero means. Yeah, so I can choose delta in that case. Also, wow. Make a comment that when you restrict the likelihood ratio, like yeah. then this means that uh, the Gaussian contraction of the channel. Yes. Alpha minus one. Right. So delta square, you get the bound uh, on the mutual ratio, mutual information, so free automatically in one line. Right. Yeah. So the, so the quadratic thing is important here to get the sharp yeah, but I mean, rates. The quadratic thing is uh, what uh, is called the uh, KL. Construction coefficient, right? Or yes. Yes. I mean, it's a very strong constraint. Yeah. No, these are super strong constraints. But yeah, so they're slightly stronger than the Debruchian thing because yeah. we're squaring things and we're getting some kind of dimension dependence in these results. But yeah, Tom. So this problem that you're looking at is really closely related to something called the CEO problem. Right. Precisely observe these things, and you study rate constraints and the ability to basically infer the latent variable subject to these rate constraints. 
that poem has been studied since the 90s. Uh, a lot is known. In fact, for looking at, say, the sum of divergences, it can be characterized precisely what the cubicle is in terms of the mutual connections, not just a strong data processing bound. Right. I mean, I think I think the the setting is somewhat different uh, than the, the the pure Gaussian CEO problem. I'm not talking about Gaussian. Or, sorry, the, than the CEO problem. It's a it's a little bit different. Um, but it has a single copy of V only, though, right? Yeah, so it's kind of a it's, one, like a mini copy. it's a it's a one shot kind of thing. So we don't get quite the same asymptotics that we're allowed to play with. Which is, I mean, it's the it, it's because we're doing just a statistical estimation rather than. But guys, you can leave it to the discussion section. Yeah. All right. I'll put it right in the middle here so they can. <laughs> all right. Thank you. All right. Thank you. <laughs>